Um, all right, so we are here to talk about copywriting for a cybersecurity audience, seven mistakes to avoid, and what to do instead. All right, looks like, all right, it's very small, I'm being told. Yeah, it looks small on mine, too, <laughs> for some reason. Um, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing just for a second and see if I can adjust this. Um, I just so, uh, Carl, just so you know, I'm being, I have a message that says someone else is sharing their screen. I don't know if that matters. Is that better? Full size now? <laughs> Cyber attacked. Yeah, someone hacked into it. Okay. All right. So it looks good. Sounds good. I'm getting a lot of thumbs up. That's a good indication. So, uh, yeah, seven mistakes to avoid and what to do instead. Um, real quick, who am I? I am Andrew Yedlin. I'm a conversion copywriter. And at this point, I work just with B2B SaaS companies. You can find me at andrewyedlin.com. And in terms of relevant experience for today, um, I've had the opportunity to work with, I think, about five different B2B SaaS cybersecurity brands. And um, with some of those, I was able to run a handful of uh, winter tests on, you know, homepage and other pages, um, and also, uh, run a lot of AB tests as well. So, um, a lot of what you're going to see here was informed by, uh, actual research and testing. Um, in addition to that, uh, I had an editor and contributor on this, uh, Vesna Mirosavliev, who I believe is, uh, watching right now. If you're in the comments, Vesna, feel free to say hi. Um, Vesna did a lot of, uh, gave me a lot of help just, uh, finding some examples and, uh, contributing some, some ideas that you'll see later on. So big shout out to Vesna. Thank you so much for helping. Um, all right. So before I get into it, uh, and tell you what this is about, really, let's start with what this isn't about. Um, this is not going to be everything you ever wanted to know about messaging and copywriting for a cybersecurity audience. I'm not a wizard. I'm not a mind reader. And I can't show you, you know, the secret formula to convert every cybersecurity professional, you know, into the next step of your funnel. Instead, what this is really about um, is what I learned writing copy for this audience, including mistakes that I made, assumptions that I made, and myths I believed. So pretty much everything here, sorry if that was showing, pretty much everything that you are going to see here. Um, is from some sort of error that I made. <laughs> so these are all, uh, you know, real lessons that I, I learned in the trenches. So um, let's go ahead and get started with mistake number one. And, and to be honest, this is one that I kind of just want to get out of the way. Um, so mistake number one is assuming that cybersecurity professionals are fundamentally different from everyone else. Yes, there are definitely some nuances and we're gonna spend most of this time talking about those differences and those nuances. Um, but ultimately, this is just to say that you really can't skip the tried and true customer research processes, um, customer interviews, customer surveys, message testing with services like Winter. Um, you really can't shortcut these things. And the stuff that I'm gonna share with you um, is what I've learned in general but obviously the cybersecurity area is very wide and varied and um, what's true for one audience might not be true for another audience. So you still have to do um, this hard work that everyone uh, seems to want to avoid. So let's, uh, with that out of the way, let's get into some of the more uh, interesting stuff. So here we have mistake number two, which is assuming that all cybersecurity purchases are led by cybersecurity professionals. Um, so this is something that has changed over time and apologies, I'm just moving my windows around a little bit. Um, but this is something that, uh, has changed over time. So when I first started working for a cybersecurity company, um, maybe about four, four or so years ago, uh, we had written a lot of the web copy, most of it, uh, speaking directly to a, someone who works on a cybersecurity team. And what we realized over time was that more and more of these purchases were not being led by someone on the cybersecurity team, but on someone uh, by someone who was, say, a developer. Um, and we had copy that was written, you know, on the website that would say things like, you know, hey, this is going to help you 
reduce the finger pointing or the back and forth between you and your developers. Um, and so if you're a developer who is, you know, on the website and you're reading stuff that is written clearly to someone else about you, that's alienating. And it sends a signal that, you know, hey, this isn't actually for you. This product is for other people. Um, sorry. Um, so what to do instead, the answer is to really make sure that you know exactly who you're talking to. Here I have an example from uh, a company called Sneak. Um, this company has really, they really, uh, they noticed that trend that more and more these things were being led by developers. These purchases were being led by developers and they really doubled down on it and, and baked it into their positioning. Um, and so here we have a homepage hero section that very clearly understands that it has this split audience of developers and security teams, and they know exactly who they are talking to. All right. Now we're going to get really into the meat of things with mistake number three, which is getting too technical. Um, so again, when I first started working with cybersecurity, companies. Um, I just sort of had this assumption because I'm a non-technical person. I just sort of assume, okay, someone who works in cybersecurity, they're like, they're totally this tech whiz and they, you know, dream in code. And, uh, you know, just because something is confusing or too technical for me, doesn't mean, you know, they'll probably understand what that is. Right. Um, and so what I've found over time is that, this area, cybersecurity, is inundated with an absurd number of acronyms and um, you know tech and and a lot of technical language. Here, I just pulled together a, a list of um, different acronyms and and initialisms that you might see in the cybersecurity space. And some of these are like really recognizable, um, like two FA. You know that one instantly jumps out to me. And some of these others I'm very familiar with. Um, some of these I have absolutely no idea what they are. And what I've started to notice is that this audience is getting uh, fed up with the number of acronyms. Um, so I came up with my own acronym for this. I call it DBI, which is death by acronyms and initialisms. And here I can, you can see a cybersecurity expert out in the wild on LinkedIn complaining about this very phenomenon. So here we have um, a guy named Chris Roberts. This guy is a chief information security officer um, and also a researcher. And here he is complaining about this ad. So we have this ad. I don't know if you can see this here. It says, manage threat intelligence of your enterprise with ESOFVMDR. Um, does, does anyone in the chat, like, does anyone know what that means? I just want to see if anyone knows what ESOFVMDR is. <laughs> All right, we'll see. You know what? Someone probably does know what it is, but they're still typing it out. <laughs> um, so here Chris goes on to kind of complain about this, like, like, what the heck is this? He goes on to, you know, add some snark about the the ridiculous number of acronyms and initialisms that are thrown at him. And so, you know, I'm kind of lumping acronyms in with technical language here, but the overall point that I really want to make is, um, you know, do, do not assume that people are as technical as you think they are. Um, there are two sort of audiences that I think of as quote unquote less technical. Um, so one is like the director or the executive. So this is someone whose job it is, is to manage or direct a team of people who are more specialized. But very often, especially in B2B SaaS, the director or the executive is going to be involved in the purchase, if not leading it. But that doesn't mean that they're, they're going to actually be in the tool on a regular basis. And it doesn't mean that they're specialized um, in whatever area that your, um, your product works in. The other audience that I would call, quote unquote, less technical is the generalist. So at smaller companies, you often have just like the one IT guy or gal or whoever it is. And anything that has to do with cybersecurity is just thrown in their direction. And that person is, you know, they're a technical person in the sense that they can uh, work on a broad range of technical tasks, but they're not 
highly specialized the way that someone who, you know, for example, is like, uh, you know, some sort of application security analyst or something like that. They're, so um, the generalist, if they, some project comes up related to cybersecurity, it gets thrown their way. As they're searching for products and solutions that can help, they're learning on the go. Um, all right, let's go on to the next slide here. Oh, sorry. So what to do instead. So in general, what I recommend doing is to err on the side of simplicity, unless you know for a fact that you're speaking to highly technical people who want highly technical details. All right. Um, so here's an example of one thing that you can do to kind of help with this problem. Um, so what I recommend here is if non-technical people are an important part of your audience, or let's say less technical people or non-specialists, I recommend keeping things relatively simple on your homepage and then using the body of your homepage and the top navigation to segment people, um, so that you can, you can, um, not just make more targeted messaging, but you can also hit them at the right level, uh, for their level of technical expertise. Um, I hope that made sense. So basically you're trying to match the, the level of technical detail to the level that that person would want. And so that's going to look very different, for example, for a CISO, um, than it would say for a developer. Um, so, you know, use that top navigation and also use the body of your homepage to segment and send people to, um, the right pages for them. Uh, one other thing that I think is worth uh, bringing up here, I had a former client who was a VP of performance marketing at a cybersecurity B2B SaaS. And he told me something, this is paraphrasing, but he told me something very close to this. He said, nearly every time we test copy that's more human and conversational, it wins. I'm going to let that sink in for a sec. <laughs> All right. All right. So now that I just told you uh, that mistake number three was getting too technical, Mistake number four, of course, is not getting technical enough. So this is the flip side of the equation. Um, what, I, what I'd like to start with talking about with this here, actually, let's go ahead and do this. Um, in the chat, it's hard for me, sorry, it's hard for me to see the chat, but um, either give a thumbs up or say something in the chat if you've heard any of this messaging or copywriting advice before. Um, ben focus on benefits over features. Focus on outcomes and always answer what's in it for me. I'm seeing a couple of yeses. Other people, have you all heard that too? This is, is, yep, every day. Awesome. All of these things are still true. The difference here is that when you have technical buyers, you absolutely have to explain how the product helps them get those benefits and those outcomes. So here I say, if you want technical buyers to move forward with your purchase process, you must explain the how. So this audience, this more technical audience wants, they want to know facts. They want to know about features. They want to know about capabilities. And they have specific questions like, does it work in this type of environment? Does it work with whatever? It gets, you know, very quickly, things can get very technical. And if you don't have some way to, if you aren't answering these questions, particularly, let's say somewhere on your website, this is the kind of stuff that people will refuse to get on a demo if they don't have this kind of uh, information. They have um, certain must haves and they sort of have to check the box before they're will willing to you know, move forward, spend time talking to someone uh, on a demo call. And so if you aren't answering those questions on your website and making it findable, um, you're really doing yourself a disservice. So two things that you can do instead. So one, this is just along the same lines as what we were talking about before is, you know, provide signposts to point towards the more technical stuff. So here we have an example from a company, I believe this is called Aquasec. Um, everything that you see, all the copy that you see right here is fairly high level. I think anyone uh, in cybersecurity understands what all of these things mean. Um, and then they provide links to drill down into more details. And so that's in general, just kind of a good way to set things up is to keep things, um, somewhat, you know, I, I don't want to say avoid, you know, obviously things like specificity, it, that's still important, but keep things relatively high level on the homepage and then 
make it easy for people who want the details to keep drilling down and get to the appropriate level of detail for them. Another thing that you can do, and this is like, this would make so many developers and technical buyers very happy, make those technical documents easy to find. So here we have Sneak again. This is for one of their product pages. This is uh, for their open source product. Um, they have right here docs at the top, this little link. And that's kind of like a sign that they're holding up to developers and other technical people. And they're like, hey, look, if you want like just straight facts, come over here because we've got all that information. So I clicked on that on that docs link and it takes you to something like this. Um, so, you know, this level of detail that, you know, you're probably not going to put this on your homepage. It doesn't belong in your homepage, but it's still information that people that some people need to see. So don't bury this stuff, don't hide it. I recommend doing what Sneak does if you know you have technical uh, people coming to your coming to these pages. Um, go ahead and make that technical documentation easy to find. Don't hide it. All right, mistake number five. This is probably um, this is probably the one I'm most guilty of uh, writing like a marketer. Um, so something that. <clears throat> Well, let's start on the cybersecurity side of things. So um, one of the mottos in cybersecurity or something that I've heard, I don't know if this is like, you know, hacky or, or cliche or something like that, but um, I've heard, which is never trust, always verify. So, you know, part of the cybersecurity professional's job is to be kind of skeptical. Um, and if they're not skeptical, then they might not be very good at their job. Um, and on top of their skepticism, they're also realists. They're very practical people. So a common belief that I heard in my customer research was this idea of, we know that we can't be 100% secure. If someone has enough time and resources and they want to, you know, get in badly enough, they probably can. And I think that this is a belief that is, is pretty common still among cybersecurity professionals. And so on the, on the flip side of things, so on the marketing side of things, what we deal with is we have a lot of pressure put on us to differentiate, right? If you've um, seen other content from winter, you know that differentiation is, I think, um, one of the, the four layers of messaging that they have, right? Um, differentiation is really important just, you know, for selling your product, both in the short term and in the long term, you have to stand out um, and differentiate. So the problem with that for marketers is that when we hear differentiate, our initial reaction is to go to extremes. And so we start doing things, we start saying things like, this is the best in class coverage for stealthy identity threats, right? Best in class. Then we start saying things like, this is the world's best endpoint protection. And we might say things like, okay, why don't we, why don't we say that we'll guarantee what's, uh, what, what we, you know, we'll put a guarantee on our value proposition here. And the, the problem with all of this, as I think a lot of you are starting to get is that, um, we are promise we're using superlatives and absolutes to, with an audience that just doesn't live in a world of absolutes. Um, so what to do instead um, so first I have here, uh, avoid using absolutes, crossed out the always just to make myself smile with a little bit of wordplay. Um, but here's a, a quote from, from Vesna, who I introduced you to earlier. And I think this is, uh, this captures it really well. So Vesna says they crave honesty and transparency. So avoid using absolutes in your copy, like the best 100%, always never guaranteed, et cetera. They live in a world where nothing is foolproof. And when your copy pretends the cybersecurity tool or service offers 100% protection in some area, they won't believe it because they know better. Very well put, Vesna. Um, so in terms, uh, oh, sorry. So one, one way that I like to think of this um, is that uh, this is just kind of like an interesting way for me to remember uh, uh, this principle, which is that sometimes 99% is greater than 100%. And when I say greater, obviously I don't mean mathematically. What I'm talking about is in terms of building credibility and being persuasive. Um, if you have a specific measured claim that is less than 100%, that is always going to be more believable than just saying 100%. People are just not going to believe that. 
Um, so what to do instead? So differentiation is still really important. So I'm not telling you not to differentiate. I'm telling you to try to avoid using superlatives and absolutes. So here's an example from a company, I guess they're called Devo, which uh, I don't know, I guess I can only just, I'm going to have whip it stuck in my head for the, the rest of the day. Um, but here they have this section on their website where they are um, sort of showing a combination of differentiators. You know, we have this unique combination of things. And these are the things that our customers tell us about why they choose uh, us over other people. And if you read through the copy here, you'll see that they don't have anything in here where they're saying this will, you know, you're always going to be protected or 100% anything or completely eliminate whatever. Um, all of this is um, more honest and more accurate, and they don't try to oversell anything. All right. Um, all right, mistake number six, I'm gonna take a sip of water. Attacking the hacker. <laughs> so this is another mistake that I made. Um, so when I first started working for a cybersecurity company, I did not know anything really about cybersecurity, except for one thing, I knew one thing, and that's that hackers are bad, right? Right? Let's see in the chat. There we go. All right, everyone's calling me out. Hackers, not necessarily bad. Um, so yeah, I learned that lesson really quickly. <laughs> um, as many of you know, they're you know ethical hackers, people like white hat hackers who um, you know they'll use their skills to find security flaws, um, and then they'll tell the company about it. They'll report it to the company. Some people do this professionally. Some people kind of do it as sport. There, uh, some companies put up bounties for it. You know, if you find security flaws, we'll we'll give you money, um, so that the security flaw can be repaired. Right? These people aren't trying to steal data. They're doing it um, more uh, for the sort of academic interest and and the sport of it kind of thing. Um, and so, what that means uh, is a couple things. There's sort of two things going on here. So. Um, one is to not attack hackers, but the other is to also avoid the hacker cliche images <laughs> that we've all seen, like the guy in a ski mask and a hoodie on his laptop. Like apparently that's the only way that, uh, you, you know, you ever want to commit a cyber crime is in a hoodie and a ski mask. Um, but here we have this really great, uh, quote from Vesna once again, she says the cybersecurity audience is sick and tired of the way hackers are portrayed stereotypes abound. And if they see these in your copy or illustrations as images, they'll roll their eyes and not take what you say seriously. Um, so this is kind of two points here, what to do instead. Um, uh, first of all, talk about attackers and malicious actors, not hackers. Um, make it clear that you're talking about people who are trying to commit some sort of crime or do harm to your company um, and avoid using that term hackers. I know that that's very basic for a lot of you, um, but for people who are maybe newer to this audience, um, that's something that you do have to learn maybe on day one. Um, and then please, please no pictures of a guy in a ski mask on his laptop. Um, I'm sure there are probably a lot of other kind of tired images and cliches, uh, you know, overused like lock icons and things like that. But um, that that is really the most egregious one that I know of. And you would think that companies know this, but um, some, I was chatting with this uh, with Vesna about this the other day. And um, one of the things that she mentioned is that sometimes uh, you'll see that, you know, maybe on the website, they're really good about this kind of thing. Like they avoid this type of language and this type of imagery. But then once you get into their content, there are like stock images and things that, you know, maybe some agency put in there. Um, so, it, you know, this is the kind of thing it might be worth doing an audit at some point to just like make sure that you're not using any of this tired, cliched imagery um, because you're, you're not going to be the brand that stands out as being, uh, you know, Know, truly empathetic and understanding of this audience if you are doing that. All right. Mistake number seven. This is the last mistake. And this is fear mongering. Um, just give me one second here to move things around. Okay, cool. Um, so fear mongering. So one of the other things that you learn in copywriting is that Pain is a really good way to motivate people to buy things. Um, so for example, we have things like the framework PAS, Problem Agitation Solution. Um, how about in the chat, have you, has anyone uh, 
can you give me a, a shout or some indication if you've heard of that uh, copywriting formula before, problem agitation solution? Yep, cool. Yep, seeing some people talking about it. Yep, cool. Um, so problem agitation solution, the idea is this is a framework. So you start by introducing the problem, stating the problem, and then uh, a problem that you know your audience has, and then you agitate it by um, sort of talking about all these different specific ways that that problem manifests itself, you know, um, really trying to make them feel that pain. You might even agitate by talking about things like, you know, hey, this problem's bad now, but if you don't do anything about it, think, you know, this is how it could get so much worse, right? And it's a very popular copywriting formula and it can be very effective. Um, but the problem is that in cybersecurity, we kind of already, there's a certain, people kind of already know what's at stake. And if you come off as fear mongering, um, you're going to alienate your audience because it sounds like you're kind of almost like lecturing them and you're not coming, you're not approaching the, the issue from the same side of the table. You're kind of like on the opposite side of the table. And here's an example of this. So, um, I have a company here, so I'm just going to read out part of this. Uh, it says the impact of a successful ransomware attack can be devastating, crippling your business for days, months or for even longer periods. They have over here, ransomware attack, it makes me wanna use that like, um, the, like <laughs> the, the narrow, the, um, the, like a negative political ad, like an attack ad, that voice that they made fun of in Parks and Recreation, where it's like, um, you know, ransomware attacks have crippled public services. Right. So we have across cities, impacted hospitals, ability, impacted hospitals ability to provide crucial services and cause significant damage to various organizations. Um, so, you know, if you this a lot of this stuff comes from like the direct response copywriting world where this kind of thing would be praised because it, it can be really effective. Right. When you're selling, sending junk mail to like millions of people and uh, you want people to really feel enough pain and fear that they're motivated to buy your solution, which is going to um, prevent and solve all of these issues. I also want to just give them a, a, a little bit of a ding here for using the, the hacker in the ski mask and, and hoodie image here. Um, so, all right. So if, if you can't do this, if you don't want to fear monger, the question becomes, is it still ap appropriate to talk about problems and pain points? And so here's another example um, of a company. This is a different example. Um, oh, sorry. First, I have a quote from Vesna again. Vesna, thank you so much. Copy should talk about the problem the product solves in an empathetic way. That's the key there. Empathetic way. Showing that the brand understands the challenges security professionals are facing. Resonance without fear mongering. I love that. So here's an example of what that looks like. So here's a company, I forget uh, exactly who this is from. I think Se Security Studio, something like that. Um, so here they have a section on their website where they're still talking about the problems that this audience is dealing with, but they're coming at it from a very different angle where it feels empathetic. It feels like we're sitting on the same side of the table. It isn't someone lecturing me about uh, all of the horrible things that are going to happen if I don't buy their product. And it's it takes a more positive spin on things, right? So it does start with this, uh, with some sort of um, acknowledgement of the situation that they're dealing with, right? Feeling cyber stressed. Is that great copy? I'm not sure, but I like the tone. Um, th this this empathetic and, and positive tone that they're taking. Um, and if you if you read through the copy here, which you know you'll all get the slides after and you can you can do a deeper dive on this, you'll see that it's just done in a much more positive and empathetic way. Um, and that's really the way that you want to address problems and pain points in general. Now, um, this is the kind of thing like if you want to go test, you know what like, using positive language versus using some fear mongering, like go ahead and test it, like prove, totally prove me wrong on this one. Um, this is more of just something that I've kind of noticed. Uh, Vesna certainly noticed. Um, there's also uh, in copywriting circles, there's also been some talk recently about, you know, maybe ever since the uh, pandemic that people are a little bit burnt out on negativity. And so some people are doing things like, you know, uh, 
changing, you know, using their PAS, their problem agitation solution formula, not using it as much and trying to lead with something that's a little bit more positive and then sort of, you know, putting some of the pain points a little bit more, uh, you know, in, in the, in the body copy and having all of the headlines and crossheads and things like that, um, be a little bit more positive. So, um, that is a trend that we're certainly noticing, but I think for the cybersecurity audience in particular, um, this is probably if I were, uh, in charge of a cybersecurity SaaS company or some, a company selling to that audience, this is probably the approach that I would take rather than the fear mongering approach. All right. Um, that was everything. Um, again, you can find me at andreyedlin.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. If you just search for me there. Um, Vesna, you can find at spectrumcopywriting.com. Um, Vesna has a little bit of a broader, um, well, I don't know if I would say broader, but uh, Vesna works outside of B2B SaaS. She also works with um, consultants, IT professionals, you know, cloud services, all, all sorts of stuff. Um, all right. I will, I don't know if, uh, Pep, do you want to come back on? How do you want to do Yo. This? All righty. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, uh, everybody, if you have questions for Andrew, please post them in the questions tab. I'll kick off with some of my own questions. So I've worked with a lot of developer audiences, which is not quite the same, but it's a technical audience. And what I know is they are very skeptical of any big claims, anything that sounds marketing. They're like, ah, no. How is the cybersecurity audience with regards to the same? Yeah, I think it's kind of um, it's kind of similar. It's the same idea that you know, and and this is something that I try to help with with my clients all the time. Is you know, any time that you have a big claim, you need proof to support that. Um, and the bigger the claim, the more proof you need. And so you know, these are, these are the kinds of audiences that like, they want to be able to put a number to something. So if you're going to say that something is accurate, you know, what's, what tests have you run where you can sh show where you can quantify, you know, okay, here's the accuracy. It was, you know, 94% accurate at, you know, detecting this type of vulnerability or whatever it is. And that's not always possible. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, in general, you really want to back things up with proof as much as possible. So the, the best ways to prove things are um, one through metrics and two through some form of social proof. So there are a lot of claims like, let's say, for example, that, you know, hey, this product is easy to use. It doesn't mean anything coming from you if you say this is easy to use because anyone can say that about their product and everyone wants to say that about their product. But if you have a testimonial from someone who looks like your audience, um, someone who your audience will see themselves in um, and they're saying this is easy to use. That's a lot more credible. So um, I don't know if that exactly answered your question, but I guess the the point is that proof is uh, almost as important as the claim itself, if not equally important um, for this type of audience. And I do see a mm -hmm. lot of similarities between developers and cybersecurity in that regard. You mentioned that often there's a, there's a buyer committee involved, you know, non-technical people, executives. So, so how exactly then do you balance this type of stuff? And do you have any examples of like, Hey, this company is doing it well, there's a nice, fine balance there. Hmm. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this kind of thing, like, especially on a homepage, it's, it's honestly kind of a copywriter's nightmare <laughs> where, right. you know, it's one of the, if you read like the classic copywriting books and you know, you learn that it's really, you want to get as narrow and targeted as you can, right? So um, ideally, it's almost like there's like, you can, you could write to one person and uh, your copy would be perfect for that one person. And when you have a homepage that is selling to an enterprise and you have a, you know, buying committees and things like that, like that's just not possible on your homepage. Like even if you're using personalization software, you know, how, how, like, there's no way that you're going to really be able to get that targeted for every single audience. And so that's why, you know, I try to think of the homepage in particular, um, in general, if you have a, this, this is true for products that have a wide, you know, a wider audience and maybe a lot of complexity that I, I try to think of the homepage as kind of like being a hub. It's kind of, I've heard the metaphor of like, it's kind of like the airport. So you have all of these different people coming to the airport 
um, for different reasons. Some of them are in a rush to get their flight. Other people want to get there early and, you know, spend time eating or shopping or whatever. Um, and the airport's job is to basically just help people get wherever they're trying to go. This person's trying to get on a domestic flight. They should go here. This person's trying to get uh, on an international flight. They should go here. This person wants to find something to eat. They should go here. And your homepage is kind of like that too. So it's a lot of, you know, kind of pointing and saying like, you know, hey, if you're interested in this, you should go this way. If you're this type of person, read, you know, go here to read more um, about how this product can be helpful to you in particular. Um, the one caveat to that is that, you know, if you have a simpler product um, where your homepage is kind of like also a product page, that might be a little bit different. Um, but certainly for these more kind of enterprise type uh, products or products that are selling into enterprise, um, I do think of the homepage as being something that is largely about segmenting the traffic to get it to, um, to get people to the right message for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's take some audience questions here. Um, Louise is asking, what about the term bad actors? You know, we were talking about cliches. This sounds like a cliche as well. Yeah, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'm trying to think if I've used that one. I, I, this would be one of those things that this is honestly the kind of thing that like winter is perfect for, right? Not to, uh, mm -hmm. Not to slide in the uh, promotion there, no, but no, you, um, you should slide in some, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, and actually, one other thing that I wanted to shout out for for winter. Uh, this is you know not not prompted by Pep at all. Um, one thing that can be really difficult with this audience is that you know I said earlier you got to do the customer interviews, you got to do the surveys. Um, a lot of cybersecurity pros do not want to do that because um, they don't want to reveal anything that could potentially put them at risk, right? That's their whole mm -hmm. job. So they don't want to just, you know, oh, I'll take a, you know, $50 gift certificate so that, I, and then spill, you know, all of these secrets or something like that. Um, and so that's one reason that uh, I really like Winter um, because sometimes you can't get access to those customer interviews. And so um, sometimes on some projects, that's been the only way that I've gotten any sort of customer insight. Um, um, messaging, but yeah, bad actors. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to see what other people, yeah, I see other people are using some other terms. I see threat actor in there. Um, and Hey, Vesna, if you want to chat any, if you have good answers to any of this stuff, mm -hmm. I'm like maybe mm -hmm. I should have let Vesna do this. Um, <laughs> Vesna knows a lot. So, uh, I'd be curious to know. And Vesna also has, um, seen some interesting research on, mm -hmm. uh, how audiences respond to messaging in the cybersecurity space and stuff like that. So, well, maybe Vesna can chime in in the chat here. She says, uh, I always have to triple check everything. Yeah. yeah. And these things change is, is the other thing. So, I, I, you know, a lot of this work that I've talked about was maybe, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. And like things get out of date quickly. Like, for example, that thing mm -hmm. I was talking about with developer led purchases, like, you know, that can, that can happen without you noticing it. Um, so, you have to really keep an eye on those kinds of things. All right, next question. Uh, Chetan is asking here, what is the alternative to fear mongering uh, for informing audience about potential future threats? Yeah, so I mean, I think that you can inform people about things that they might not know without, um, it, it comes down to the tone, I think. It comes down to the tone. So, um, and, and you know, like this, this just popped into my head. It could be interesting to try taking some uh, some copy that you find or that you've written that's kind of fear mongering, pop it into Chat GPT and and say rewrite this with a you know more positive and empathetic tone, uh, you know whatever find find some prompt and and sort of see what that comes up with just so that you can sort of get a feel for sort of how to pull the lever on tone without necessarily changing the the core of the message itself. Um, so yeah, I think that it doesn't, it's not necessarily about what you say as much as it is about how you say it. Mm -hmm. So tone, that's a, that's voice and tone are, are tools that you can use in copywriting. I would also think that your homepage or, you know, uh, your website is kind of too, you're not raising awareness with your website that's your marketing that's your social media content your you know any content marketing is like raising awareness when they come to your site they already know they have a potential problem right so i think it's also 
the fear mongering should not be even part of your sales pitch. They already should have some, you know. Um, uh, Michael is asking, if you were to test signposts, how do you view the type of links signs within them? How do I view the type of links signs within them? Yeah, I'm not sure also either uh, what it means. Uh, maybe I was confusing. Maybe the the term signposts. I don't know if that if that's confusing. But basically, what I'm just talking about are um, sections with some uh, with some copy and a link um, that is basically just like uh, pointing you towards another page. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm really just talking about good old fashioned regular links and buttons and things like that. Okay. Uh, uh, Michael, if we misunderstood you, please rephrase the question and ask again. Um, uh, another question here. How does storytelling play into the complex B2B sales copy like cybersecurity? Yeah, I think, honestly, I think you were sort of touch what you were touching on is, um, kind of similar to where my head's been at with this too. So a lot of times we have um, like a lot of times we have this, this story that we tell, we have, we do a lot of like positioning and messaging work and we come up with this, you know, this narrative and maybe some uh, so, sort of core concept. I, I can't think of, I'm not, this is an example from outside of cybersecurity, but like, you know, if you know Loom, right? So Loom does, uh, Basically, it's like you make you can record a quick video screen share or webcam, and then you can quickly send a link to someone else. And like that's what it does. It's video messaging. They have this whole story about um, you know we're helping people uh, cut down on how much time they spend in meetings. We're replacing mm -hmm. meetings. That's what this is for. And the the reality is that uh, uh, they're doing that because they're trying to tell a story that's more interesting than just video messaging. They're trying to stand out a little bit and they're trying to point to something that's, that's higher value, sort of grow the value or, or grow the perception of value in people's minds. Um, the problem is that when someone is looking for a way to quickly send videos to people, if they go to your website and the hero section is like, reduce your meetings by X percent or something like that, or like no more, you know, stop having so many meetings or something like that, mm -hmm. that doesn't match the motivation of what drove me to the website. Um, so I'm not saying that they can't tell that story, but it's probably not what they should be leading with. So, you know, in general, I think of the top part of a homepage and, and most other pages as, um, largely about matching the intent that drove people to come to that page in the first place. And if there's some kind of like brand story to tell behind that, I will often wait until later to the page to tell that story. So the people who are, you know, keep scrolling down, they're still going, they're still going. They've kind of given you permission to find a little bit, to, to sort of talk a little bit more, talk a little bit more, and they might be more willing to read. So I do kind of, tend to keep homepages a little bit light and breezy at the top for people who kind of want to move quickly, find what they need to find and move on with their day. Um, and then leave some of that storytelling stuff until later. And that doesn't mean, you know, the story can also still just be baked into things. So, you know, if the story, if you're talking about something like, you know, something that's based on like the hero's journey or something like that, right. Your, your prospect is the hero and they have, you know, uh, some sort of major, problem that they have to overcome and then the mentor comes in and gives them the lightsaber and whatever like that kind of thing that will probably be kind of like baked into your messaging anyway because you're going to be talking about here's the problem that you're dealing with and here's the solution and here's how we solve this problem and, and so on and so forth um so i guess all of that to say that you know i mean we can it depends on what you mean by storytelling um but sometimes i like to subordinate some of that storytelling um, in the interest of serving the intent and motivation of the people who are actually coming to that page with a specific problem, specific thing that they're looking for. I hope that answered the question. Awesome. Terry here is asking for examples, like who is doing it right uh, with respect to web copy and custom references? Yeah, sure. Um, so one that I, I really do like, uh, Sneak. So that's one that I showed you. That's S-N-Y-K. I hear some people pronounce it Snick, but I think it's Sneak. Um, I always, uh, liked a lot of their copy. I'd be curious to see if, um, so Vesna pulled a lot of these examples for me. I'd be curious to see if Vesna had any, um, any favorites out of all of those. So, um, mm -hmm. maybe if, if Vesna doesn't mind, 
um, dropping a few examples in there of companies that are doing it really well right now. Um, Sneak is one that I go to pretty quickly, um, especially in terms of that kind of like, you know, more developer focused type language. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, and looks like uh, we've handled all the questions. So Andrew, thank you again so much for entertaining and educating us. Everybody connect with Andrew on LinkedIn. And uh, until next time. Thanks, everyone. Peace.